Hallelujah! He is risen. The Lord is risen Hall- awesome. It's so good to be with you all today. Uh, I'm very grateful to be here with you. I hadn't been out to this part of the metro yet, yet, and so uh, thank you, thank you for your welcome. Let's get into the word. Today we will look at Peter's sermon in Acts three. This sermon is given inside the Jerusalem temple and can be summed up in what we call the mystery of our faith. Messiah has died. Messiah is risen. Messiah will come again. So I work for the church's ministry among Jewish people. So my job this morning is to remind you that Jesus and his gospel message are Jewish and that we should contemplate what that means for us Gentiles here in Western Pennsylvania or wherever we may be listening from. We'll see in in Acts 3 that Jesus is the redeemer and prophet that God promises Israel, that we must guard against anti-Semitic readings by always reading the New Testament from within Judaism, and that the Jewish context of the gospel and the Jewish identity of Jesus must stir in us love and compassion for our Jewish neighbor. So let's set the scene in Acts 3. It's late May or June in Jerusalem. As Peter preaches, he expects the people to know what happened to Jesus of Nazareth. It's probably a few days or weeks at most since the biblical Feast of Weeks, what we call Pentecost. This was one of the three mandated pilgrim festivals when Jewish men were required to travel to Jerusalem to worship in the temple. It is thought that the population of Jerusalem tripled in size during the feast times. The city is probably still full of pilgrims. Peter and John are headed into the temple to pray. It's about three in the afternoon on a warm day. And as they enter the temple complex, Peter and John are stopped by a lame beggar. Give us, give us alms. How does Peter answer? Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. (laughs) And then what happened? And he went walking and leaping and praising God, walking and leaping and praising God. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So this little ditty has caught the worshiper's attention, yes? <laughs> no, but seriously, why has what is happening, this lame man, caught everybody's attention? Because healing the lame was a sign of the coming of the Messiah. The prophets speak of a time when the lame will walk and the blind will see and the captives will be freed. These were the signs of Jesus' ministry, and he was constantly doing them. But most of the city thinks Jesus is dead. It's been maybe two months since that fateful Passover and that wannabe Messiah Jesus was crucified. Another disappointment. But suddenly, a man everyone knows has been lame from birth is walking and leaping and praising God. Children of Israel, Peter Peter booms. Why do you wonder at this? Why do you stare at us as though by our own power and piety we had made him walk? Do you think we did this? No, it was the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, glorifying his servant Jesus. So remember that all these people that have caught the attention of the lame man walking, they're Jewish worshipers in the temple. They are either on their way in to pray or on their way out after praying. When a Jewish worshiper, even today, begins their daily prayers, they say, Praise be you, Adonai, our God, and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. 
So Peter is saying, the God we came to the temple to pray to has healed this man through his servant Jesus. We're going to walk through some of Peter's sermon this morning. I wanted to walk through the whole thing. But seeing as this is my first time, I wanted to get invited back, and I thought an hour sermon <laughs> was probably not the way to start. But we're going to walk through part of this sermon and unpack what his Jewish listeners heard. Peter gave this sermon in the temple to observant Jews who knew the scriptures, the Torah, and the prophets. Even though the temple officials eventually interrupt Peter, 5,000 people came to believe in Jesus that day. So it was an effective sermon by the power of the Holy Spirit. If you've got a Bible, I encourage you to follow along in Acts 3. So in verse 13, I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys get there. Acts 3. And we'll be starting here in verse 13. So Peter says, God, by healing the lame man, is glorifying his servant, Jesus. When we see Jesus called God's servant, we mustn't just read over it as some arbitrary selection from a thesaurus, as if Luke were writing and he says, hey, Paul, what's another word for Messiah? No, no, no. This is a very deliberate word choice, servant. It is a reference to the servant of God in Isaiah. Peter later unpacks this thought in his first letter when he quotes Isaiah 53. In, in, second, in 1 Peter 2, he says, The Messiah suffered on your behalf, leaving an example so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, nor was any deceit found on his lips. When he was insulted, he didn't retaliate with insults. When he suffered, he didn't threaten, but handed them over to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you were healed, for you used to be like sheep gone astray, but now you have turned to the shepherd who watches over you. When Peter says Jesus is God's servant, he means the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, who dies for the sins of Israel and for all the nations. And as Peter continues preaching, he does not pull any punches as he tells the story of Jesus. God's servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him, but you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for the murderer to be granted to you. You killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. This passage and others like it have been mishandled throughout church history. So let's pause to understand how that's been mishandled and then tread lightly as we unpack Peter's message. There's an ancient line of theological thinking that still persists, sadly, in some corners of Christianity that reads the crucifixion accounts and concludes, the Jews killed Jesus. Jesus is God, the Jews killed God. It's the anti-Semitic charge of deicide. When these biblically obtuse Christians say the Jews, they mean the Jews for all time. Does this sound silly? In Steven Spielberg's semi-autobiographical film, The Fablemans, the director depicts several anti-Semitic incidences suffered by a boy named Sammy Fableman. The bully jocks call out Sammy's Jewishness in the locker room. They mock his name and call him Bagelman. They hang a bagel labeled Jew hole in his locker. The abuse escalates when one boy calls him Christ killer and demands that Sammy apologize for killing our Lord. Sammy explains that he wasn't alive 2,000 years ago. 
But the bullies don't care. The bullies then proceed to beat their Jewish classmate until he's curled up on the concrete with a bloody nose. This is not something out of Spielberg's imagination, but, some, but likely something that happened to him or somebody he knows. Where does this vitriol against Jews come from? Some of it can be blamed on church father John Chrysostom. In the fourth century, he preached eight sermons against the followers of Jesus, both Jew and Gentile, who continued to celebrate Easter at the same time as Passover, and who would sometimes go to synagogue to celebrate the biblical feasts. Here's an excerpt of one of these first sermons. Tell me this. If a man were to have slain your son, would you endure to look upon him and accept his greeting? Would you not shun him as a wicked demon, as the devil himself? They slew the son of your Lord. Do you have the boldness to enter with them under the same roof? After he was slain, he heaped such honor upon you that he made you his brother and co-heir. But you dishonor him so much that you pay honor to those who slew him on the cross that you observe with them the fellowship of the festivals, that you go to their profane places, enter their unclean doors, and share in the tables of demons. For I am persuaded to calling the fasts of the Jews a table of demons because they slew God. Yikes! Three centuries after Jesus died and rose again in Jerusalem, Chrysostom held the Jews of Antioch. 300 miles and 300 years away, responsible for killing Jesus. How wrong is that? Still, some sections of the church have read Chrysostom uncritically and continue to accept his take on the culpability of Jews for all time. They have missed that God says, the soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. They, these Christians, but also we, also forget that in the Gospels, and especially in the first chapters of Acts, Nearly every interaction, conversation, and teaching happens between Jewish people. In Acts 3, Peter, a Galilean Jew, is preaching the pious Jews, likely from all over the world, who are in the temple to pray. Peter never thought of himself as anything but Jewish, nor did Jesus, nor did Paul. To avoid reading passages such as these anti-Semitically, we must consciously read them from within their Jewish context. Peter's harsh words, you delivered Jesus over and denied him before Pilate, you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer instead, and you killed the author of life. These harsh words are one reason that I believe this sermon was given within days or maybe just a few weeks of his Pentecost sermon that we read in Acts 2. When the Holy Spirit was poured out and 3,000 were baptized and came to faith in Jesus. Peter expects his listeners to not only remember, but to have been present that Passover Eve two months before when Jesus was crucified. They say that preachers are to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Peter has afflicted these Jewish worshipers by calling out their part in Jesus' death. But then he very quickly offers comfort. I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. This Jesus has God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. When Peter says, you did not understand, I hear Jesus say from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Remember that Peter, too, denied Jesus, not once, but three times. 
And when Peter saw the risen Jesus, he eventually came to know and accept that Jesus had forgiven him for those betrayals. I have a colleague who says that he believed in the Jews' guilt early in his ministry until he was challenged by someone. When Jesus said, Father, forgive them, did the Father answer Jesus' prayer? Does the Father hear the Son praying? Does he give Jesus the desires of his heart? I hope so. Because the scriptures say that the resurrected Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, ever interceding for us. I'm counting on the Father's mercy for me for the sake of his Son. So certainly God forgave those responsible for executing Jesus. Okay, so back to Peter's sermon, verse 18. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. So we could have a multiple week study just on this verse. But here are some of the big prophecies that Peter is alluding to. And, and later on, when we get to the road to Emmaus reading in a couple of weeks, what was Jesus telling those two disciples? And I think it's some of these passages. Genesis 3. Jesus is the seed of the woman who is fatally bitten by the serpent as he crushes its head. Genesis 22. Like Abraham offered Isaac to God, so God offers his son for the sake of the sons of Abraham. Genesis 37 to 43. Jesus, like Joseph, was betrayed and sold by his brothers. He was thought dead and returns to life to save the family. Psalm 22. Jesus, son of David, cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When his hands and his feet are pierced. And Isaiah 52, 53. The servant of God is considered a sinner is beaten for the healing of his people and killed to cover the sin of Israel and all the nations. After Peter lays this out, he has a good old-fashioned Baptist altar call. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed to you, Jesus whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. It's more a Jewish call to repentance than a Baptist one. He gives three reasons for them to repent. One, that your sins may be blotted out. That's Yom Kippur language, the Day of Atonement. To this day, when Jews fast on the Day of Atonement, it is so that their sins will be blotted out from God's record books. Those of us of a certain age may say, so that God can white out our sins. For the younger folks, so that God can delete your sins from the spreadsheet in the sky. Number two, repent. That times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. One Messianic Jewish commentator says the times of refreshing refers to the Messianic age when God's king brings peace to all the earth. And in the Mishnah, an early Jewish commentary, there is a similar reference to the refreshing or cooling of one's spirit in the world to come. And number three, repent that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus. Jesus ties his return and the start of the messianic age to the preaching of his gospel of repentance to all the nations of the world. Here, Peter also ties repentance to Jesus' return. The ascension, <clears throat> the ascension happened maybe a month before, but Peter is already preaching Jesus' return to his fellow Jews. 
Is there a link between Jesus' return and his Jewish brothers recognizing him as the Messiah? When Jesus lamented over Jerusalem, he said, You will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. To this day in Hebrew, this is how you welcome someone when they come to your house. Baruch haba, b'shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus said Jerusalem will not see him again until they welcome him home. Until they call for him to come. How then will they call on him and whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have not heard? And how are they to preach without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. There's more to Peter's sermon that we won't tackle this morning. Like Jesus is the prophet like Moses and God calling Abraham to bless all the nations who repelled at Babel. I don't expect you to remember everything I've thrown at you in the last few minutes. Truly, a thorough breakdown of the Acts 3 sermon could be a multi-week Bible study. And I hope that I've whet your appetite to dig into God's word. The takeaway today, Christian, is that this story we step into when we believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Messiah and are saved is a Jewish one. We are disciples of the Jewish rabbi Jesus. We worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What we are celebrating this Easter season was foretold by Moses, Samuel, David, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Zechariah, and all the rest. When we get to Pentecost in a few weeks and remember the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we are celebrating the fulfillment of a prophecy by the Israelite prophet Joel on a feast day prescribed in Leviticus. Why can't our Jewish neighbors see the fullness of who Jesus is? That's a message for another time. But even then, I do not have the full answer. Only God knows, really. The story of Joseph, though, gives us hope. I mentioned before that in Genesis, uh, in the Genesis account of Joseph, his brothers didn't recognize him when he was dressed like an Egyptian ruler. Many Jews are content to say that Jesus is the Messiah for the Gentiles, but they can't recognize him as Jewish under hundreds of year, under hundreds of years of Christian garb. What matters for us is how we will react and interact with our Jewish neighbors who say Jesus isn't for them. Will we demonize them like Chrysostom, the Spanish Inquisition, and Martin Luther? Yes, Martin Luther was a raging anti-Semite at the end of his life. He called for synagogues to be burned about, among many other horrific things. Will we demonize our Jewish neighbors, or will we love them sacrificially as Jesus calls us to? Will we hold the sins of the Israel Defense Forces against all Jews, or can we intercede for Israel like Jesus and say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus of Nazareth is the prophet like Moses, the suffering servant of God, the author of life, he was killed by sinful but ignorant humans, Jewish and Gentile. But he rose from the dead, having atoned for our sins, the sins of our neighbors, and to redeem us all, Jew and Gentile. Like Peter, let us receive our forgiveness and restoration, and then invite others to repent and enter the new life offered by Jesus' nail-scarred hands. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks, for your works are great. 
Your work is worthy to be praised and held in honor. And your righteousness endures forever. You are mindful of your covenant to Israel and the nations. And you have shown your people the power of your works in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus the Messiah. Embolden us like Peter by the Holy Spirit to invite others to repentance and eternal life. Amen.